Governor Dewhurst, Speaker Strauss, um, I want to say thanks to both of you for your service. You know, the three of us are, are um, bound together by shared duties, shared responsibilities, uh, and most importantly, shared outcomes. When the final gavel uh, sounds this legislative session, we're not going to get it points for our, our speeches or extra credit for our process. We're going to be judged on our results and uh, those outcomes that we achieve for the people of Texas. And I'm confident our efforts will be found wise, prudent, and effective. So let me begin by greeting my fellow statewide uh, officials, members of the uh, judiciary that are here with us, our members of the legislature, our distinguished guests, friends and fellow Texans. I'm honored to uphold our congressional tradition uh, and, uh, or excuse me, our constitutional uh, tradition and, and uh, to speak to you today on the state of our state. As you know, I owe everything I am to Texas for raising me, blessing me with opportunity, teaching me the value of good old-fashioned hard work. The shaping process that began under the watchful eye of my loving parents, Ray and Amelia Perry, continues to this day through the greatest gift of my life, Anita Thigpen Perry. She represents all. <laughs> she represents all that is good about Texas women with her grace, strength, compassion, and I might add a wonderful smile. She also shares in my greatest joy, and that's our children, Sidney Griffin and his new wife, Meredith. I also credit the, uh, the Boy Scouts with uh, molding my character and shaping my values. And I want to recognize the scouts over here to my left from the Capital Area Council. They're here with us today. They're here with us today, and, and uh, I also congratulate them on the conclusion of their centennial celebration, 100 years of Boy Scouts in this country. Now, throughout my life and, and service to the state, um, my optimism about Texas and its people has never wavered. And, and by any meaningful measure, the state of our state is strong. As I look out across this chamber and, and I see familiar faces of so many of my friends and, and colleagues, I'm reminded of one of those who are no longer with us, especially my old roommate and mentor, Edmund Kempel. Um, his passing was a reminder to all of us that life is really fleeting, that, that friendships matter and that we only have a short time to make a difference. As legislators, you get 140 days to make that difference, and the clock's ticking. <laughs> you know, as this session gets rolling, some folks are painting a pretty grim picture of our situation. So I think we need to balance their pessimism with some good news that continues to flow from our comparatively strong economy. You know, have the doomsayers forgotten that Texas added more jobs in 2010 than any other state? <laughs> Last year, the growth rate of Texas jobs was nearly double that of any of the other top 10 states. Now, some partisan commentators have tried to downplay our economic success by giving sole credit to our energy industry. 
Now, let me tell you, I'm mighty proud of our energy industry and what it's done and still does for our state. But our economic strength is built on a much broader base and a much broader group of, of industry sectors. Our job growth occurred across a wide variety, including business services, health care, construction, manufacturing, hospitality, and of course our substantial energy industry. According to the Brookings Institution, uh, Texas has six of the nation's 20 strongest performing metros. Those figures paint a bit more encouraging picture, don't they? <laughs> our economic strength is no accident. It's a testimony to our people, our entrepreneurs, and yes, to the decisions that are made in this building. Employers from across the country and around the world, they understand that the opportunity they crave can be found in Texas. And they're headed our way with jobs in tow. People are seeking opportunity as well. And newcomers arrive every day, ready to pursue their dreams. For the sixth year running, Allied Van Lines showed that Texas was the top destination for relocations. Yeah. Need I go on? Well, don't mind if I do. <laughs> Newsweek magazine had four cities, four Texas cities, on their list of top 10 American cities best situated for recovery. And Forbes considers our growth prospects best in the nation based on projected increases in jobs, income, and gross state product in a category that really affects the bottom line for Texas families. Our state leads the nation in strong home values. According to one industry analyst, the strongest appreciation in home values over the next seven, seven months will take place in Houston, in the Metroplex, and in Amarillo. According to our meticulous, hardworking comptroller, Susan Combs, Texas has 10 consecutive months of sales tax growth. I could keep on listing accolades, but you know, the fact of the matter is I don't want to make other states have a complex. And we got a lot of ground to cover this morning. So let me boil it down to these simple truths. The core elements of our economy are strong, and Texas is still the envy of the nation. We have a strong advantage over those states that care more about the expansion and extension of government than they do the freedom and prosperity of their citizens. As Exhibit A, I submit the Illinois legislature's recent decision to raise taxes as much as 66 percent. Now, that may have seemed like an easy fix from Springfield, Illinois, but the fact is it takes on a completely different meaning for families on a budget or employers on tight margins. You know, some experts have predicted that other states will follow their lead, including our key competitors, California, New York. When those states dig deeper into their citizens' wallets, Texas looks even better by comparison. I can assure you that we will compete and win jobs from those states, or should I say more jobs, since we've already won thousands of them. It might be time to send a few more letters to their employers, inviting them to move to Texas. I'd include stories about business leaders like we have in this historic chamber today. You know, about 10 years ago, a small group of entrepreneurs in Los Angeles created a company called LegalZoom. They grew rather rapidly. When it came time to expand, they looked to Texas, where they found the right mix of factors, including our workforce, our quality of life, and investments from the Texas Enterprise Fund and the city of Austin. And we're proud to welcome them and their 600 jobs to Texas and thank them for their contribution to our economy. For our friends from LegalZoom, right over here.
You know, they represent those jobs that are among the tens of thousands of jobs that the Enterprise Fund has brought to Texas, along with nearly $15 billion in capital investment. As the nation struggles to recover from the ongoing economic crisis and states go head to head for new jobs, now is not the time for Texas to roll up our tents and go home. Instead, it's time to keep attracting good Texas jobs by funding our premier economic development tools like the Enterprise Fund and the Emerging Technology Fund. If, thank you. You see, I happen to believe if we pull the plug on our economic development efforts, nobody would be happier than my fellow governors. <laughs> I'll guarantee you, Mary Fallon up in Oklahoma, Susanna Martinez over in, in New Mexico, or Chris Christie in New Jersey, tickle them to death. You see, they're creating their own versions of the TEF to compete for the jobs that we've been landing. We owe it to our citizens to maintain our competitive edge because our economics, our economy's relative prosperity doesn't extend to every Texas household. I'm deeply concerned about those Texas families that are dealing with joblessness and, and the fear and the uncertainty that comes along with that. These are friends of ours. I mean, these are people we live with, General, in our, in our neighborhoods, and they worship in our churches. They, they wonder how long they're going to have a roof over their heads. And an and, and unemployment level that is hovered about a full point below the national average is a good indicator of our comparative strength. But, Senator, it also tells a tough story of more Texans than any of us can or should accept when it comes to our vision for the state. Our work will not be done until every Texan who wants a job has a job. Research and experience tell us that the only way to create those jobs is to knock down the senseless obstacles to economic growth. And for more than a decade, those of us elected to serve in this building have been working diligently to remove those obstacles, create a level playing field, following a few simple rules. For example, Eddie setting aside resources for a rainy day that has given us a resource that other states would love to have and some in our state would love for us to spend dry. <laughs> Emptying the savings account to pay for recurring expenses is a bad idea, whether it happens at home, the workforce, or with our state budget. That approach would not only postpone tough, necessary decisions, but also leave us ill-equipped to handle bigger emergencies in the future. Therefore, we must protect the rainy day fund. Now, secondly, when we created a predictable regulatory climate, uh, we did so that employers know what to expect from one quarter to the next. I'm talking about programs like our flexible permitting program that has contributed to cleaner air and economic development in the state of Texas. Between 2000 and 2009, this program helped Texas achieve a 27 percent reduction of statewide ozone levels, more than any other state. Nitrous oxide, NOx, it's fallen by 53 percent. Almost every metropolitan area is meeting the current air standard. For those of you keeping track, Dallas is within just one part per billion of meeting the standard as well in true Texas style. We made those air quality improvements while Texas employers were creating more private sector jobs than any other big state in the nation. Now, thirdly, we've reformed our legal system to cut down on frivolous lawsuits so employers and doctors don't spend all their time in court. Since tort reform took effect, more than 26,000 medical license applications have been received in this state. 33 counties got their first emergency room
position. And since the passage of those reforms, Senator Lucio of the Rio Grande Valley has added 220 physicians to care for your growing population. And joining us today is one of those, Dr. Javier Cardenas. He's an OBGYN who returned to his hometown of McAllen to practice medicine thanks to tort reform. Doctor, thank you for being with us today. You see, he represents all those doctors who are able to practice medicine in our state without the ever-present threat of frivolous lawsuits. Those doctors represent better access to care, higher quality of life, and more importantly, lives saved. And fourth, thanks to legislative leaders like Rob Eisler and Senator Florence Shapiro, we've increased accountability in our public schools. We've engaged legislators and local districts and teachers and parents in the process and genuinely reformed education in our state. Over the past decade, the state's share of public education spending increased from $11 billion per year to $20 billion in 2009. That's an 82% increase. Now, part of our push for accountability has included a sharper focus on the basics like math and science and English and the social studies. Those efforts are paying off in the lives of our young people. For example, Texas has been recognized as one of only four states closing the achievement gap in math. On the latest national assessment of educational progress, Texas children scored significantly higher than their peers. The quality of education in our state is getting better and better preparing hard work in Texans to apply their legendary work ethic and provide for their families. Those families sent a pretty clear message with their November votes. They want government to be even leaner and more efficient, and they want us to balance the budget without raising taxes on families and employers. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, leaders in this room, like Chairman Ogman, Ogden and Chairman Pitts, they have balanced the budget before, and they'll do it again. We just can't forget that dollars do far more to create jobs and prosperity in the people's hands rather than the government's hand. Taking more money away from Texas families, <laughs> taking more money away from Texas families and employers is not the answer to our challenges because they've already sacrificed plenty. Balancing our budget without raising taxes will certainly set a nice example for the rest of the nation. But we have a bigger motivation than that. Balancing our budget without raising taxes will keep us moving forward out of these tough economic times, creating more jobs and opportunity, leaving Texas more competitive than ever. Now, the mainstream media and, and, and big government interest groups are doing their best to convince us that we're facing a budget Armageddon. Texans don't believe it, and they shouldn't, because it's not true. Are we facing some tough choices? Of course we are. But we can overcome them by setting priorities, by cutting bureaucracy, by reducing spending and focusing on what really matters to Texas families. Now, fortunately, we saw this challenge coming. That's why we didn't touch the rainy day fund in 2009, Governor. That's why David and, and Joe and I called on the state agencies to get involved in the process. Starting in January of 2010, we asked them to identify 5% savings in the 10 and 11 biennium and 10% in the 12-13 biennium. Those agency leaders responded with a concerted effort, taking stock of their organizations and, and, and coming up with proactive cuts. 
that will keep Texas moving in the right direction. And, and to keep that momentum going, the three of us recently asked agencies to identify an additional 2.5 percent savings for the 2011 fiscal year. My office is an agency as well. And we cut 34.6 million in this cycle, which equates to almost an 11 percent of our budget. As all Texans tighten their belts, we need to do more than just shave a dollar here and a dollar there. If ever there was a time to truly reform our approach to governance and streamline our organization, it is now. Frank discussions, frank discussions about the true purpose of state government must be followed by a willingness to act on our convictions. There should be no sacred cows in this business. And that reality is reflected in the budget that I submitted this morning. To eliminate duplication, let's consolidate functions like moving the Department of Rural Affairs into the Department of Agriculture. Let's suspend non-mission critical entities like the Historical Commission or the Commission on the Arts until the economy improves. Let's take an even closer look at the way we deliver essential services to make sure we're taking the most efficient, most cost-effective approach. We should follow the lead of HHSC, whose Inspector General has saved the state more than $5.3 billion since its creation in 2004. You know, when you apply that same concept across state agencies and departments, these practices could significantly reduce wasteful spending and save taxpayers dollars. A state inspector general would work directly with the agencies, enhancing the state auditor's efforts, improving efficiencies. And while we're at it, let's be sure we're not burdening local authorities with unfunded mandates, because they're facing their own budget challenges as well. You know, in the end, our decisions should always reflect a fundamental truth. We work for the people, not the other way around. With a balanced budget as our foundation, I encourage you to move quickly on the emergency items that I've submitted. Most Texans, regardless of party, believe the integrity of elections would be improved by requiring participants to show a valid photo identification before voting. I wholeheartedly agree, and I thank Senator Frazier for carrying that legislation. Thank you, Troy. We also, we also need to protect private property rights, tougher eminent domain laws, using the approach taken by Senator Estes and Representative Guerin in their bill. We need to protect the unborn by fast-tracking the sonogram bill so that women are fully medically informed before they make the life-changing decision to terminate a pregnancy. We also need... <laughs> we also need to hold Washington more accountable with a bill calling for a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. As those bills come to my desk for signature, I hope they'll be closely followed by others aimed at improving our public education system, especially efforts to reduce the dropout rate. So let's expand our virtual school network with a virtual high school that will not only enable students who have dropped out to earn a degree online, but also give students access to those classes that their own schools may not offer. Encourage students to stay in high school. Let's require them to either be enrolled or working towards a GED if they want to get or keep their Texas driver's license.
Let's also create an incentive program for employers who encourage their employees to continue their high school education. Let's offer employers a $1,500 tax incentive for every employee who earns their diploma or GED after receiving two hours off per week with pay to study or go to class. Let's expand our STEM academies, those innovative schools that teach young Texans the science, technology, engineering, math skills that they need to compete in the high-tech jobs and for those, college, for those college scholarships. We also need to help school districts reduce their expensive in these tight budgetary times, made worse by a certain Texas congressman who singled out our state for punishment in pursuit of his own agenda. One approach is to encourage districts to enter into shared services arrangements with other entities in their area. On the higher education front, we've experienced enrollment growth over the last two years higher than any time in Texas history. Our public institutions had 200,000 more students enrolled in 2010 than they did in 2008. So let's be sure those students and their families are getting the best value for their time and money. Change doesn't come easily or naturally in those big institutions, but it is critical to educational efficiency and effectiveness. You know, back in September of 2009, I ordered a review of cost efficiencies at our universities as a way to make education more affordable. One idea that emerged from that process is called outcome-based funding, in which a significant percent of undergraduate funding would be based on the number of degrees awarded. Texans deserve college graduation for their hard-earned tax dollars, not just college enrollment. As families continue to struggle with the cost of higher education, I'm renewing my call for a four-year tuition freeze, locking in tuition rates at or below the freshman level for four years. As leaders like Senator Zaffarini say look for ways to, for more, I should say, low-cost pathways to a degree, it's time for a bold Texas-style solution to their challenge that I'm sure the brightest minds in our universities can devise. Today, I'm challenging our institutions of higher education to develop bachelor's degrees that cost no more than $10,000, including textbooks. Let's, let's, leverage, let's leverage those web-based instruction, innovative teaching techniques, and aggressive efficiency measures to reach that goal. Imagine the potential impact on affordability and graduation rates and the number of skilled workers that it would send into our economy. Speaking of skilled workers, we have a ready source of technical skills living amongst us that are all too often, it goes untapped. Countless Texas veterans receive top-level training in the military, but have a hard time getting credit for their knowledge and skills when they return to civilian life. We should support what one school calls college credit for heroes. With the support With the support of Senator Vandepute, the Texas Workforce Commission, they're working with the Higher Education Coordinating Board in our community colleges on a plan to offer veterans credit for their skills and experience. The goal is to accelerate them into the allied health occupations, which are critically needed across our state, offer immense opportunity to these brave men and women. So as we increase the opportunity inherent in our economy, let's increase the accountability, the trans, or I should say the transparency and the efficiency of our legal system as well. 
Let's take the next step in our fight against lawsuit abuse by sparing our citizens and our job creators the financial burden of defending themselves from frivolous lawsuits. Texas needs a loser pays component in our legal system. In which those who sue and lose are required to pay the court costs and the legal expenses of those they sue. You know, Texas is one of the very few states who don't have an early dismissal option for obviously frivolous lawsuits, but we should. We need to make our system more accessible to the little guy by setting up expedited trials and limited discovery for lawsuits with claims between $10,000 and $100,000. These reforms would further improve the legal climate in our state and impact even more energy, stability, and security to our economy. See, the pursuit of true stability and security also requires us to maintain law and order, to keep our citizens safe. Last fall, I proposed legislation targeting sex offenders to better protect our, our citizens. We should empower prosecutors to seek life without parole for certain repeat sex offenders, requiring active GPS monitoring of high-risk offenders for three years after they've done their time and been released by TDCJ. You know, on a, on a broader scale, we should also continue our investment in border security because the threat of cross-border violence has only grown as the drug wars escalate. And I don't raise this issue of border security as a criticism for our neighbors to the South, but to show our resolve and unity in the struggle as they deal with a wave of violence unlike anything outside of the world's war zones. Our relationship with Mexico predates our establishment as a state. And our proud Hispanic citizens are friends, neighbors, partners, family. Our desire is to strengthen our trade and cultural ties with Mexico through a climate of law and order that brings peace and security to our border region. The, the vicious criminals who murdered American missionary Nancy Davis just two weeks ago are no doubt inflicting the same violence and intimidation on the people of Mexico. And they must be brought to justice. I must admit that news of Ms. Davis's death brought the events of this last fall rushing back as we grieved with Tiffany Hartley over the loss of her husband David at the hands of narco-terrorists on Falcon Lake. And Tiffany's with us here today. Tiffany, will you stand so we can say we love you? Thank you for being with us. Thank you. No, we continue to pray for you as we demand the perpetrators of this brutal crime be brought to justice. See, Tiffany's presence reminds us that border security is not just a hot button issue for the talk shows. It's a matter of life and death for American citizens in the border region and in communities across our state. We must keep taking the fight to vicious Mexican drug cartels and the gangs that operate in our state on their behalf, as we support the men and women of law enforcement who remain on the front lines of this struggle. I also want to thank Senator Williams and Representative Solomon for supporting my efforts to abolish sanctuary city policies that restrict police officers in this state as they work to uphold the law and protect our communities. Joining us today is Officer Jocelyn Johnson from Houston. Her husband, Rodney, was killed by an undocumented, undocumented alien who had previously been in police custody multiple times. Texas law enforcement professionals must have 
the discretion to use their judgment. Judgment that has been honed by years of training and experience. When it comes to inquiring about immigration status during lawful detentions and apprehensions, Jocelyn, thank you for being here today, for your grace, your courage in these most difficult times. God bless you. And Senator, I think it's uh, high time to seriously address the demand side of illegal immigration as well. We must establish criminal penalties for employers who knowingly hire workers who are here in violation of immigration law. And at the same time, we need to increase the heat on the parasites who repeatedly exploit those seeking a better life in our state. I want to commend Representative Sinfronia Thompson and Representative Randy Weppard for their unrelenting focus on human trafficking, which impacts far too many in our state. It's time to target the worst offenders with a 25-year minimum sentence for first conviction for continuous human trafficking. I'll tell you, it's frustrating that we're still having these border security conversations. But Washington remains an abject failure in this area. It's part of that frustrating paradox where Washington neglects their responsibility for areas clearly within their purview while interfering in other areas of which they're neither welcome nor authorized. <laughs> Despite our frequent request, Washington has yet to dedicate sufficient resources to secure our international border. We still need 1,000 National Guard troops to support current law enforcement operations on our border until they can provide those 3,000 more Border Patrol agents. We also need Predator drones flying along the Texas-Mexico border, providing real-time intel to our state and local operations center. It's time for our delegation in Washington, on both sides of the aisle, to step up and speak out in support of our state's needs. If it seems that their interest in this legislative session is higher than usual, <laughs> that's to be expected in a redistricting year. So when you do hear from your congressman, try guiding the conversation away from redistricting and suggest that they should be asking, how can I help Texas by ending federal mandates? Or how about easing the growth of Medicaid costs? <laughs> then we can ask them about their progress on repealing the Doggett Amendment that's taken more than $830 million from Texas school children, <laughs> taking it away from teachers right now. Enlist them in our ongoing battle against an activist EPA intent on derailing our Texas air quality program, which is cleaning our air as we create jobs. Tell them it's time to repeal Obamacare. <laughs> repeal the mandates that will cripple our health care system and a price tag that will bust our budget. Our Medicaid population and the accompanying fiscal burden are growing as we speak. And in 2014, doctor, Obamacare will cause them to explode. This Washington-centric health care plan puts many states on a collision course with bankruptcy. And instead of oppressive mandates, we need solutions like block grants, the freedom to improve health care delivery, innovation, flexibility, local input by senators like Jane Nelson. 
we most definitely do not need Washington encroaching even further on our individual liberties. I hope you'll support Representative Creighton's legislation stating the simple truth, upheld by at least two federal courts, that it's unconstitutional and wrong for the government to force someone to buy health insurance. In this and other areas of overreach, we must be united in sending one clear and simple message to Washington. Enough. Enough. Stop it. The differences between Texas values and Washington's self-serving games has never been more stark. The federal government's efforts to accumulate more power by bribing us with our own tax dollars are simply unacceptable. We must continue to call attention to the essential truth of the Tenth Amendment and commit these 28 words to memory. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively are to the people. Our founders knew that a federal government powerful enough to run our lives would be powerful enough to rob us of our liberties. In this chamber, where so many great Texas leaders have served, we affirm the principle of state sovereignty and proclaim without reservation that Texans can run Texas better than bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. Where Washington encroaches upon the rights of states, this state will push back with resolve and the full force of the law. And in that regard, we are blessed to have a leader with the wisdom and courage of Attorney General Greg Abbott. <laughs> who is using every resource at his disposal and working with Texas lawmakers to protect the best interest of our state. Jeff, some will probably say we're just spalling for a fight. And I'll admit, Texans rarely walk away from a tussle, but we'll also never walk away from our freedom. Our state was built on that freedom and its unlimited opportunity. The spirit of discovery and adventure that drove the earliest settlers still beats in the hearts of Texans everywhere. As they push past the unknown, in the laboratory, in the marketplace, in our universities, Long known for our bountiful natural resources, Texas is now esteemed for its greatest resource, the intellect and character of its people. Our culture of sturdy pragmatism, forged through centuries of exploration, exertion, and endurance, strengthens our resolve and equips us to overcome the challenges that we now face together. As our neighboring states and the other 49 states flounder about, some oppressing their citizens with more taxes and driving away jobs with bad policy. Texas will make the right decisions and emerge stronger. And as I've said before, and I believe this will someday be regarded as the Texas century as our resolve, our discipline, and our commitment to one another carries us to brighter days and blazes a path for other states and even a path our federal government could follow. Our charge is to lead, and together we will blaze this path. God bless you, and through you, may God continue to bless the great state of Texas. <laughs>